Welcome, every happy warrior. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Thank you for being part of the show, and thank you, as always, for everything you do to help promote the show. Uh, Some of the people you tell about the show, some of the people to whom you send a link or a uh, uh, a URL, uh, some of them become listeners. They must do because our numbers continue to grow, and I greatly appreciate that. That makes it a lot of fun for me. You know, um, back when I was still living in South Africa, I went on a camping trip, and I had an old Land Cruiser, and uh, uh, I think it was three or four of my friends, I think it was three friends, and we decided to go uh, towards the western end of the country of Botswana, uh, into the, towards the border with Namibia, and to explore uh, that edge of the Kalahari Desert a little bit. Um, it's a fascinating place. Uh, it's it's a desert, and yet there is a vast uh, presence of wildlife of many, many different kinds. Um, it, it was unspoiled and remarkable to, to, to be there. Um, what happened is that we developed a leak in the radiator of uh, this old car, and by the time I realized that we were losing water out of a, a little pinhole, uh, we'd already lost too much of it to be able to safely drive without the engine overheating and seizing up. So uh, we found the hole and uh, repaired it with a combination of chewing gum and duct tape, basically. But uh, we needed to get more water into the radiator, and we were out of water. Uh, We had a small amount of drinking water left, but I was very reluctant to pour that into the radiator. I didn't know what we were going to do, but it was evening time, and um, we were getting ready to pitch camp for the night, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came trotting a bushman. Now, bushmen are the people who are indigenous to that part of the Kalahari Desert, and all I can say is that if you would like to know a little bit more, you'd like to get a sense of what these Bushmen, well, I'm going to say were like, because I haven't been there for many years now. But uh, if you want a thoroughly entertaining movie, something that's absolutely clean, you can watch it with children, and it's, it's just, it's a beautiful and well done movie, get hold of a, a South African movie from years ago called the gods must be crazy and uh, it's about a uh, a pilot tossing an old coke bottle out of the window of his little light aircraft his Cessna or his Piper and uh, a bushman founded it uh, he, he came across this bottle and uh, what happened to him and his tribe as a result of this ordinary glass bottle it's it's an absolutely beautiful film. But back to my adventure, uh, this bushman came trotting along, and we uh, managed to sort of signal to him in universal sign language um, that we needed some water. Did, did, like, was there any water nearby? And with a huge grin on his face, he signaled that he understood, and he reached into a sort of backpack he was wearing, and he pulled out a long a reed, like from a, uh, you know, uh, reeds that grow on river banks. It's like a long, hollow straw. And he, um, he signaled to us to follow him. And he went no more than 50 yards to what a- appeared to be a dried up riverbed. Um, you know, it looked like it hadn't seen water in a, in a hundred years. And he squatted down in the riverbed and he twirled this um, reed between his palms and in so doing it burrowed itself into the ground until he was about, I don't know, maybe two feet, 20 or 30 inches below the surface. And then he put his mouth to it and sucked out, well, 
it turned out to be a sort of combination of water and sand because he spat it out onto the ground. But then he continued and he drew out another uh, mouthful and his cheeks bulged. And then he took hold of an empty ostrich egg that he had in his bag and it had a hole in one end and he spat the water into the ostrich egg. And he repeated this several times. By the way, an ostrich egg uh, is about the volume of 20 or 30 regular chicken eggs. Easy. It's, they're, they're large things. Um, I, I don't know how to explain. I mean, I, uh, probably maybe 10 inches in diameter or something like that. They're, they really are amazing things. And uh, he carried on at this until he'd filled the ostrich egg with water. And he signaled to us to take it and pour it into the car, which we did. And we came back and he proceeded to fill it a second time. And uh, we poured it into the radiator. By this time, it was, it was fairly late. It was getting dark already. And um, that was enough water. So we knew that in the morning we'd be able to continue driving. And... Um, we uh, we thanked him, and to the best of our ability, no common language, but um, one of my friends had a watch, and uh, it was, you know, not a, a wildly expensive watch or something, but it was a, a, a nice watch, and I, I don't know if it was gold-plated or, or what it was, but, you know, it wasn't a Rolex or anything, but it was a nice watch, and my friend took it off his wrist and sort of made a gesture of um, gifting it to the the bushman who didn't he shook he didn't want to take it and we all please you know take it yeah we we wanted to we wanted to reciprocate for his kindness and um, at any rate finally you know we strapped it on his wrist and he smiled and he he he, he, he seemed very proud of it and very delighted and we were happy and so we said our farewells and we went to sleep. Uh, in the morning, we uh, woke up, we made a fire, we put up some coffee, we struck the tent and packed it away in the back of the, uh, the Toyota Land Cruiser. And uh, we got into our seats and I'm just about to start the motor when I see sitting on the hood the gold watch we had given the Bushman the night before. Yeah, he had returned it. And um, from then onwards, I honored the Bushman by making him a participant in one of my thought experiments. And the thought experiment goes like this. I take the Bushman and we uh, get on a plane in Windhoek Airport and we change planes in Johannesburg Airport, and we fly all the way to O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And he's absolutely amazed. I mean, he, he was looking out the window for all the daylight period of the trip, and I, I could only imagine what was going through his mind. And then we landed in Chicago, and uh, we took a, uh, a taxi, and I, I walked with him along Michigan Avenue, all the stores and the tall buildings. And I was just enjoying this look of absolute childlike amazement at what he saw. Don't forget, he's a bushman. He has never seen any of this before. Even the plane ride was a complete new experience to him. And, uh, you know, and then we, um, I took him up to the Sears Tower, which is now called, I think it's called the Willis Tower now. And we went up to the 110th floor where there's an observation platform and showed him, you know, the, the, the view of the lake and the view of uh, Chicago. And again, it was just fun seeing the, the, the amazement and enjoyment and, and astonishment on this Bushman's face. And he made no effort to conceal his feelings. This was very gratifying for me. And then uh, we went for a walk in Lincoln Park. And, um, and after all our busy running around, uh, when we reached a water fountain, um, it, uh, it was time to get a drink. And so I showed him how that works. You, you turn the, the lever on the faucet and water spurts out. You put your face down. You can drink um, the water. And it's refreshing and nice. So I showed him that. Then the Bushman did the same thing. And he could barely stop I mean, he just 
He let the water wash over his face and then he put it on his hands and he drank and then he played around with it some more and then he drank some more. And finally, I had to tear him away. By this time, he was already learning a little bit of English. And so before we went to the airport to fly him back all the way to Windhoek so he could return to his tribe and his family in the Kalahari Desert between Namibia and Botswana, uh, I asked him if there was anything I could give him as a gift before he goes. And he, uh, with a look of some embarrassment, he bowed his head and he said, yes, I would really like a gift before I return. I said, what can I get you? He said, could you give me a faucet, a water faucet? And so we went to the local um, Home Depot store and we went in and I went to the plumbing department. I bought a faucet. I put it in, paid and put it in his hands. He was so excited and so delighted. And then we got back in the car to go to the airport and I saw out of the corner of my eye, he was turning on the faucet and I could see a look of huge disappointment. No water was coming out. And it's it's interesting, he didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to make me feel bad. So he continued being grateful for the faucet, but I could see that there was a huge difference between the way he looked at it now and the way he looked at it when I first gave it to him, because now he realized that the faucet did not give him any water. And so uh, um, he was hoping to radically transform the lives of his family back in, in uh, the Kalahari Desert. He thought that he had a way of supplying as much water as anybody needed all the time. That's what he really thought. Very understandable. Why, why wouldn't he think that? Given the circumstances of my thought experiment as I describe it, uh, yeah, why wouldn't he think exactly that, right? And that's precisely what he thought. Look, um, what's gone wrong here? What's gone wrong is that he was completely unaware that underground and out of sight, there was a vast network of pipes and far away there was a reservoir of water and there was a filtering station and there was a plumbing station and all of these things combined to work with along with who knows how many thousand human beings that were operating this water system all of these things working in collaboration with one another made it possible for us to turn on the faucet at a water fountain in lincoln park and let water flow into his hands and into his mouth. Let's imagine I do a variation of the thought experiment. And this time it's not about water, but I take uh, my Bushman friend who is immigrating to the United States, I take him to meet a uh, stockbroker friend of mine. And we spend a few hours and the stockbroker sits at his desk. Every now and then the phone rings and he answers it and speaks to somebody. Every now and then he initiates, dials a phone, sp speaks to somebody, and then hangs up. And um, at the end of the day, the, uh, the owner of the stockbroking stock firm at which my friend works came in and handed my friend $950 in cash. And the Bushman said to me, what's that about? I said, well, he's now got money that will let him go and buy whatever he needs, food. He doesn't have to walk. He can put gasoline in his car. Uh, all of that. He said, well, yeah, but why did that man give it to him? And I said, well, he gave it to him because my friend, the stockbroker, um, served him. Well, the next day I discover that my Bushman friend has bought a desk and a chair from a used furniture company and he's had a phone installed and he's sitting there and I say what are you doing he says well I'm I, I want to make nine hundred and fifty dollars I want to get that at the end of the day and I see your friend sat at his desk and spoke on the phone uh, if it rings I'll speak on the phone and then I I want somebody to come by and give me nine hundred and fifty dollars and it's exactly the same story as the water. My, my Bushman friend is entirely oblivious to the reality of a vast interconnected network of hundreds, if not thousands of people that work in the stock exchange and who make the markets 
and who um, buy shares and sell shares, all of which um, my friend, the stockbroker, is able to match to his clients. He knows this client wants this kind of high uh, risk, high r income security. This one wants a, a, a government guaranteed security. And he's able to speak to his clients and he speaks to uh, people at the stock exchange and he's able to effect the trades and of course he gets paid but my bushman friend is not aware of all that invisible network of interconnectedness he doesn't he's not aware of it he only sees the stockbroker speaking on the phone just as he saw uh, the the faucet gushing water in lincoln park these things are really important to understand why? Well, think about it. When is your life better or worse if you know a lot of people? I shouldn't even have to ask that question, but uh, unfortunately, the reality is that today many people do not get this simple truth. Okay, and uh, when I before I explain it further, I want to give my website rabbidaniellappin.com, and the reason I want to give the website is because. I want to make it possible for you to um, get hold of the free ebook. You can download it instantly called The Holistic You. And what this does is explain how your concern with trying to improve your finances and your faith, your friendships and your fitness um, and uh, your uh, uh, what did I say? Finance, friendships, fitness, faith, and f uh, f and family, of course, and your family, uh, making all those things grow in an interconnected way makes you do better on all fronts. And so, please uh, do that. The other thing is that um, for those of you who hear this show on time. Um, and if you happen to be in the southern Pennsylvania area, I am speaking for a wonderful conference in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania on Friday morning, July the 8th. So that's, that's pretty soon. But uh, you could still get tickets and uh, attend if you would like. And the way to do that is, you'll see in the description below, I have a link by means of which you can get a ticket for you or a few for you and some friends so as that uh, you can attend a wonderful investors conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Friday morning, July the 8th. And um, you will, at the link below, you will get more information of who some of the other speakers are and what's going on. But it's a conference that I always, I've always i spoken for them for several years running, including, by the way, during COVID, because good for them, they didn't stop the conference. They still kept holding it. And so every year I come away very uplifted and encouraged and inspired and optimistic. And I think it'll do the same thing for you. So uh, definitely look into attending the conference I'll be at on uh, July the 8th, 2022, <laughs> uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. When I first came to the United States, I, I didn't arrive with nothing. I, you know, I had a little money. I didn't have a lot, but I had some money. But the main thing I had was letters of introduction to uh, about a dozen different people in New York. So in other words, friends that I had in London and friends I had in South Africa, upon hearing that I was going to be coming to New York for the first time ever and I knew nobody, they said, oh, you know what, um, Here's I'm going to give you a letter, take this letter to my friend so-and-so and so -and -so, and." Uh, and he'll, you know, you'll have you'll have a contact there. And so I remember one of them was a university president uh, of a college in New York. Uh, one was the head of a large public relations firm. Uh, I had a letter of introduction to a senior official at the South African consulate in New York. Um, I, I had introductions to two well-connected rabbis. Uh, I had a letter of introduction to the head of a real estate company. 
Um, I had a letter that introduced me to a partner in a large New York, New York firm of lawyers. Um, I had a letter introducing me to a produce merchant who supplied um, excellent New York restaurants and hotels with fruit and vegetables, and, and there were a few more. I wasn't alone, you see. I didn't just parachute into a city not knowing a soul. I arrived with about a dozen letters of introduction, and that changed everything. I wasn't a refugee. You know, I, I, I had friends already. Well, I made a point of contacting every single one of the people for whom I had an introductory letter, and I made a point of meeting every single one of them, sometimes more than once. And that was my uh, fulfilling the first word in the title of today's show, connect. Okay, connect. That's the, that was the first thing. Then I got to communicate. During these meetings and in subsequent get-togethers, I told all these new connections I told them clearly and succinctly that I was a competent, entertaining, and informative speaker. And I gave them examples of the topics that I could speak about. Well, eventually I found myself receiving social invitations. More than one of these people said, um, why don't you have dinner with uh, my family and I you know, next uh, Sunday evening? Um, some of them said, you know, come to visit with us for a, a Shabbat, for a Sabbath. Um, some of them invited me to, uh, to other social events where there were a lot of their friends. Before long, inquiries about my speaking for various events, some of them paid, and, but many at no cost. And I threw myself into every engagement regardless of whether it was going to make me any money or not. The money at this point wasn't my main concern. I wanted to become known, and I wanted to know more people, and I wanted to become seen as somebody who gives rather than takes, somebody who was there to make a contribution, somebody who wanted to participate. And that was the next uh, word in the title of today's show, right? Connect. That's what I did. I came with letters of introduction. I connected. Communicate. I told them about myself. I asked them about what they did. I found about their interests. I exposed my own. I revealed my personality. Uh, and then we collaborated because I ended up speaking for various events. Um, you know, I, I could have done better. I did certainly make some mistakes, quite a few, in fact. But overall, I did just fine, far, far better than if I had spent my first three months in America sightseeing and touring and going to Broadway shows. There would be plenty of time for that later. But initially, I knew I had to connect. I had to communicate I had to collaborate. I had to do something together with them. I had to do things that would benefit them. And this now brings us to the fourth, and that is create. I learned how to bring special added value to the programs that hired me to speak. If they were not-for-profit entities like churches and synagogues and clubs and um, educational organizations and so on, then I would offer to help them raise funds. I would gear my speech to encourage the audience to respond positively to a fundraising appeal. And so the end result is even when they paid me, I made it possible for them to benefit by far more money coming into them than they spent on paying me for my speech. Um, I suggested special breakfasts. In other words, I said, look, you're engaging me to speak for your audience on Tuesday night. I won't fly out, you know, at the crack of dawn on Wednesday morning. I'm going to stay over in a hotel Tuesday night after my speech, 
and I'll leave, you know, uh, midday on, on Wednesday. That means that if you wanted to hold a breakfast on Wednesday morning to which some of your high net worth um, fans can be invited or your major donors can be invited to have a private get together with last night's speaker, I'll be happy to do that. No, you know, no, no charge or anything. I just, I just want to help. Well, as you can imagine, um, the, the word spread and pretty soon I was making a living just out of my speeches and um you know i had i had a constant set of requests which when you think about it really wasn't too bad for an illegal immigrant right it was fine uh, i did i started doing a number of corporate e corporate events and i spoke for the partners of that law firm friend i told you about and in those kinds of corporate events i made absolutely sure that my presentations contained very practical and applicable business specific tips and tools and techniques and the result of all this well it's what we call commerce they benefited from my serving them and i benefited from my serving them right there's there's real value here when you think about it and that's why I entitled today's show, Connect, Communicate, Collaborate, Create, and that's commerce. You start off with connecting, uh, and, and so it is. No matter where you are and what your situation is, make sure you are connecting to more people. Don't sit back every week should enable you when Friday comes, you should be able to write down how many new friends you made that week. How many new people did you get connected with? Um, are you taking trouble to make sure you remain connected? Are you nurturing existing connections? You need to be doing these things. If unless you know, unless you're complacent and content with where you are, and you're not interested in progressing with your faith and your finances and your family and your uh, f friendships and your fitness, then I guess you don't need to have any more connections. But the more connected we are as human beings, the more effective we are, and believe it or not, the happier we are as well. And so when you've made connections, you've got to learn how to communicate. Be comfortable talking about what you do, but be equally interested in what they do converse right remember god gave us two ears and one mouth to remind us to do twice as much listening as we do talking but when we do talk it should count right you don't want to waste time telling silly jokes or talking about what was on television last night but you want to uh, home in on ways that you might be able to help them or help friends of theirs that's communicate and then collaborate. Hey, here's a way we could do something together to the benefit of both of us. Be creative, right? Create. Come up with ideas that would enable you to collaborate in a productive way. And the result of all this is commerce. You know, um, I, I love the word commerce. I just... It rolls around my mouth so comfortably because that's what it is. It's human beings serving one another for mutual benefit. There was an interesting French guy. Uh, he was a judge and he was a philosopher and he was a writer. His name was Baron Charles de Montesquieu. Baron Charles de Montesquieu. Um, he died before the French Revolution, which I always thought was a good thing because the events of the French Revolution would have broken this man's heart. Um, the, the destruction and the, 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 the horribly wrong and crude ideas, um, it ended up that the French Revolution, with its plan 
to create a brand new France of equality and brotherhood, fraternity and love. Um, these people knew as much about how to build a society as much as someone who's lived his entire life in the Sahara Desert might know about fly fishing. And Baron de Montesquieu uh, was spared having to see what the French Revolution did to uh, the land of France. But here's something in his writings that I've always carried with me, and I'm quoting, here it is. It, it really deserves a refined French accent, but you will be very relieved to hear that I'm not going to try and do that. Uh, Montesquieu said, Wherever the ways of man are gentle, there is commerce. And whenever there is commerce, the ways of men are gentle. Isn't that beautiful? And it's absolutely true. Uh, therein lies the great paradox of socialism. And when I say socialism, you know, not necessarily uh, the hardcore socialism of Cuba or North Korea or the old Soviet Union, um, but I'm speaking about the, uh, the socialism that is practiced and promoted and preached in, uh, in uh, most, of, most of Western civilization today has surrendered to the, 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 the gods of socialism. And there are a lot of noble sounding platitudes and they speak about uh, how um, you know, when when everything will be good, when socialist values take over in, you know, in the United States government, uh, there are real self-proclaimed socialists. There are people who will tell you they want more of a socialistic world. And they say it'll be a kinder world, a more benevolent world. And the reality is it never worked out that way. The truth is that you get better treated in the world of commerce than you ever do in the world of socialistic government services. Just talk to somebody who's had to have medical treatment at the hands of the United Kingdom's um, nationalized health system. Speak to people who've had to deal with Canada. Uh, think about whether you'd rather deal in the United States of America, would you rather deal with the post office which is technically a non-profit organization, or would you rather deal with FedEx or UPS? Commerce makes for kinder, gentler people. And socialism uses force. And the end result is that uh, you, know, you, you don't get treated well under a socialist system. You just don't. You see, socialist systems at, at root promise to supply to everybody everything they need. Really, it's from the cradle to the grave. And that's the dream of socialists in America. They find themselves handicapped by the Constitution. They believe the Constitution is a primitive obstruction to all the good things they want to do for the people of the United States of America. They want to give them social security and they want to pay for their children's education and they want to take care of all their medical needs and um, the, everything from start that's all they want to do in other words turning it into a hundred percent government socialist economy but it doesn't produce the results of kindness or even compassion or gentleness that you get from free commerce. That's a reality. You see, people's needs are insatiable. Just think about medicine for a start. Why does everyone say, people in the know, people in the know say that the United States medical system is unsustainable. Well, yeah, because people are using ambulances to go to the uh, emergency room to get bandages and aspirins. And their needs are not only elastic, but they're infinite. There's no limit. And once they expanded it to psychiatric as well. So now you can take an ambulance and go to the emergency room 
if you feel lonely or anxious or insecure, right, all those natural parts of life that should be solved spiritually are now going to be solved with tablets. That's how it now works. And so the government has to grow and grow and grow, and the state has to become bigger and bigger and bigger, which means the individual has to become smaller and smaller. And nothing belongs to anyone, and everyone becomes dependent. Well, yes, so why would you be surprised that alienation follows and that we all feel that our dignity vanishes in those circumstances? Yeah, Try going to the Department of Motor Vehicles. See if you feel uplifted by the experience. And then, by contrast, uh, you know, go to a go to a car dealership, and you'll be invited to sit down, and you'll be you'll be given a cup of coffee. Well, yeah, they're just trying to sell me a car. So what's wrong with that? How does that hurt you? They're not reaching into your pocket like other people I know. There is nothing wrong with commerce. It doesn't need any defense. Commerce produces contentment and happiness, it doesn't mean everybody gets whatever they want. doesn't mean that at all. That, that doesn't happen under any system. Our wants are always bigger than the ability to fill them. But one of the things that commerce does do is it builds connections. It encourages you to meet people and figure out ways to collaborate with people and to connect and communicate all of those things which if you know contrast that with somebody who's on the government dole all you've got to do is pick up his welfare check and his uh, section 8 housing allowance this person could literally stay home playing computer games video games with the only th you know occasionally going out to a store to pick up his benefits check but somebody who's actually engaged in the in the field of commerce is obliged to connect with people because you are incentivized because you will make more money if you know more people and if more people like you and if more people trust you. And so what, uh, what I'm, I'm devoting today's show to is the idea that you need to be doing more than you are currently doing. I don't, I don't care what your situation in life is, but you need to be doing more right now of connecting with other people, finding ways to serve more people, um, finding ways to nurture relationships and retain friendships, find ways to collaborate and to create. In other words, let commerce be your guide. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. And I'll tell you something else, and that is that not many people outside the world, people who are in academia and people who are in socialistic enterprises, they don't realize that commerce is fun. It's a challenge meeting new people. It's a challenge finding ways to collaborate with them and finding ways you can serve them. It's almost, it's, it's, it's almost like a sport. You can really enjoy it. You take pride in doing well at it. And the side benefit is you make money. That's right. It's, it's a good thing. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And so um, find ways to connect with people. Um, some tips. Okay, one tip is train yourself to remember people's names. When, in, when you're introduced to somebody new, at the outset of this exercise, uh, you know you have your little pile of uh, 20 or 30 three by 5 index cards held together with a rubber band. I've told you this so many times, right? Um, and so as soon as you can, you, 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 you sort of turn aside and just get a moment of privacy, and you scribble down the name of the person you just met. Well, by the end of the evening or the end of the party or at the end of the gathering, why wouldn't you have five or ten or fifteen new names new people and now you know their names and you're going to remember them also make a point of using their name so later on in the evening go to uh, up to the person and and say um you know jack it was really fun meeting you i really appreciated hearing about what you do 
Um, Jack is going to be deeply moved that you remembered his name at a casual social gathering. You will stand out by doing that. So really make a point of remembering people's names, training your memory to lock a person's name in a vault in your mind alongside a picture of his face. And so you will be able to recognize that person and greet them by name. Huge value in that, really. So that, you know, that would be a tip I'd recommend immediately for you to, to make a part of your normal life. And, uh, and uh, another thing is try and find ways to do favors for people you've met. And not just new people, you know, old friends as well. Always be on the lookout for being helpful. <coughs> Maybe it might mean um, connecting them with somebody else. You know, um, I just recently uh, was in a situation where um, in, in one week, I met one person who told me what he's looking for in his business, what he needs. And that same week, four or five days later, towards the end of the week, I was having lunch with somebody else who mentioned that there's a friend of his who is able to supply this particular commodity and he's looking for people who have a need for it. And I was just, I was so delighted to send off an email to both those people saying, you know, John, meet Jack. Jack, meet John. Uh, you have something in common, namely this, and I explained what it was. And I, you know, I'll leave it to you guys to uh, take it from here. But I'd love to hear later on that uh, this has been beneficial to you both. Um, you know, sometimes it's um, uh, if if, you know, I get... Uh, tickets to a ball game that I'm not particularly interested in. I don't. I don't just waste them. I look for somebody to give them to, and and so on and so forth. And there's so many different ways that you can do that as well. Finding ways to be good to God's other children. There is real value. The connection is hugely important, and um, some of you may be interested in actually taking a look at a very important biblical point, and that is that the benefits come to a group, not to an individual. In other words, you know, back to my Bushman thought experiment, um, if, if you are disconnected from other people, if you're all alone and you're isolated, um, you're, you know, people are homeless because they're isolated. They're not isolated because they're homeless. And when you are disconnected from other people, there is no way for blessing to flow to you. So making sure that you are connected and, um, and you're constantly upgrading your connections. Listen to this. Uh, this is the, in the five books of Moses. The third book is the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. And uh, verse uh, 3 reads as follows. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season and the land will yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield your, for their fruit, and your, your wheat will reach its ripeness, and the grapes will reach their ripeness, and you will have enough bread that you could more than you could want. You will also have military security, and uh, you won't experience any fear at all, and um, uh, your, your children will do well. All of this, you know. Now, here's the interesting thing. You heard me reading this, and I said, if you do this, then, you know, you keep my statutes, says the Lord, and keep my commandments and do them. Then I'll give you this, and I'll give you that, and I'll give you the other thing. And you probably hear me speaking in the singular, you as in you singular. But that's not how it's written in the Hebrew. You see, in the Lord's language, you can actually tell the difference between a singular and a plural. And so in English, if I say, will you come here? You have no idea if I'm talking to a classroom of children and I'm asking them all to come here, or if I'm speaking to one person next door and I'm saying, please come to my room, right? But in Hebrew, there's a big difference. And so in the English, it sounds as if this is a little private deal. You know, if, if me 
if me, me individually, me, if I follow the Lord's instructions, well, then all these good things will flow to me. That is not what it says. It's only in connection and collaboration with all the other people in my society as well. You've got to be connected, and then benefits flow to everybody. But it isn't possible to benefit alone and uniquely without it also helping other people as well. So worthwhile, worthwhile thinking that one through and realizing that I'm probably safe if I say to you, you are not doing all you could do, right, in the area of connecting, communicating, collaborating, and creating. In other words, are you really doing enough in the field of commerce, or could you be doing more? And I believe that you could be doing much more. And if you work on your five Fs, your family, your fitness, your friends, your finances, and your faith, then you will become a happy warrior, fierce, funny, fearless, and formidable. So until next week, visit the website rabbidaniellappin.com. Uh, check to see if you, time-wise and geography-wise, would like to be at the conference I'm going to be teaching at next Friday, July 8th in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And, uh, of course, be in touch. And, by the way, if you don't have a Bible to look up the verses I was quoting, then please go to the website at rabbidaniellappin.com and get yourself a Rabbi Daniel Lappin recommended Bible. You won't be sorry. So, until next week, I wish you a week of moving onwards and upwards in your five Fs. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.